Well, I'm a little dumbstruck. I need, to, I need to get myself together here for just a minute, if I may. The singing was extraordinary tonight. I mean, uh, thank, thank you, Celine. Uh, if you can stand about one more minute, and then I'll pray and let you sit down. But I'm just, I just want to say, when, you, when I walked in here, and the glory of God is just fill the house. I can't say enough about Lawrence Bishop right over here. Man of God. Man of God. Powerful preacher of the word. And then I look over there, and there's Elvis. Right down the line, here comes the next pastor's going to be, right, right on down the line. That gift and that anointing that's upon him. Then I look over here at Pastor Darlene. There is not a woman on this earth that can preach and deliver the word under such an anointing like Pastor Darlene. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I want you to give them all a big hand. And then this wonderful anointed Field Driscoll, full of the Holy Ghost, the power of God, now stands there alongside his wife. And I just see nothing written across solid rock, but all the great things that have happened in the past. I believe are going to pale in comparison that solid rock is going to is going to shake Cincinnati and all of this region with the power of the gospel I speak it forth in the name of Jesus let's give the Lord a praise offering for solid rock Lord Jesus I ask you to take this humble unworthy oh how grateful I am how grateful I am give, give me a minute I'll be back hallelujah how grateful I am for all the good things. <laughs> okay, sit down. <laughs> I got to get it together up here. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, let me, let me see if I can get going on this a little bit. And there's my beautiful bride. I'll tell you, I've, I've never known anyone that loves church more than her. And since she, I married her when she was 16, her parents had to go down there and get it signed, I found out. I didn't know that. You told me that the other day. And uh, I was in, so in love with her, I drove every night from Fort Worth to Dallas. Her dad passed her over there for many years, and mine in Fort Worth. And I'd, that, they had that turnpike, it cost 50 cents. I paid for a good portion of that turnpike, didn't I, baby? <laughs> and I dated her every night, except the one night coming back from dating her, I went to sleep and pulled over and stopped. And the police came by and tapped on the window and said, Son, you can't sleep here. You need to get on home. And 10 miles down the road, I went sound asleep and ran in under a big bobtail truck. And it tore off the whole roof of that thing. And it landed back like a can opener. It was all hanging off of one, one edge, like a, you've opened up a can. It's hanging like that. And those policemen told me when they pulled up, neither one of them wanted to come up to the car because they knew my head would be in the back seat. Because it clipped off even the steering wheel right there and the padded dash and where the seat was. And I had swerved it this way. And, uh, and the Lord spared me. 
It was a miracle. I guess he, he uh, said, well, if he's going to go to sleep, he shouldn't do that. I'm going to protect him because uh, I've got some work for him to do. So I'm, uh, I'm grateful for all of it. But then that night that I couldn't get there, I was all bandaged up. She came to see me, so we never missed, we missed a night. And here we are. A year later, we had our son, and two years after that, we had our daughter. I put them in a the baby in a bassinet, and away we went. And uh, here I am, 50, going into my 58th year, preaching this gospel. And I'm grateful. Stand up, baby. Stand up and let them see you. She's prettier than ever. Hallelujah. I got something started this morning. I've been on this for a long time now, and I just can't quit talking about it. I want to ask you one question. Are you ready for eternity? Are you ready for eternity? Are you ready that if your heart were to stop beating right now, are you ready? Are you ready if the trumpet should sound before this service is over? Are you ready? I want to talk about being ready for eternity. May I do that tonight? I'd like to begin by saying this. This is a resting and it'll get your attention. Is there a little water up here somewhere? Lots of it. Have you ever stopped to think about this? That the greatest crowd that will ever attend church, the greatest crowd. This, this really went deep into my spirit. That the greatest crowd that will ever attend Solid Rock, both the North Church and the South, will be one day after the rapture of the church. Now just think about that for a minute. Doesn't matter what preacher may have been in here or what event took place that packed this place. But the greatest crowd will be in this church and every church in the nation will be one day after the rapture of the church. Now think about that. Let me tell you a story real quick. I told this morning, I'm sure I've shared it at some point. But my dad, my dad preached a lot on the second coming of Christ. And he preached a lot on the rapture of the church. Uh, in fact, uh, even in the scriptures that I'd read in, in Matthew uh, chapter 24, uh, I'll just kind of paraphrase it like this. It says, two will be in the field and one will be taken and the other one will be left. Two will be grinding at the meal, one taken, the other one bailed, and left, and you could kind of expand that and say, two will be sleeping in the bed, and one will be taken, and the other one left. Because in a moment, the scripture says, when you least expect it, in Matthew 24, it's replete through that chapter. It says, in an hour, when you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. Now, I want to tell you why I believe that people have grown accustomed and almost dull to the fact that he's coming again. Otherwise, this building would be packed right now if they believed we're on the brink of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then it says in an hour when you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. I submit to you right now at this very moment, if people believe that we're on the brink of the greatest historic, dynamic, unbelievable, earth-shaking event the world has ever known, it's going to be when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is snatched away called the rapture of the church. So I'm on a campaign to preach on, are you ready for eternity? I want to start some trouble throughout America and the rest of my life. Are you ready? Because he's coming when you least expect it. I say it now again tonight. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, my dad would preach that. And he would preach it. And I would be so overcome with emotion sitting on the front seat, even as a child, that it didn't matter. 
I'd get saved every service. I've been saved probably 5,000 times before I was 15 years of age. <laughs> but every time, he, and then he'd preach on hell. But then the one that always would get my attention would be in an hour when you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. Well, we had a watch night service. And that thing is, goes after midnight. Well, my dad, they didn't make allowance for it like started at 9. We still started at 7 o'clock. And then we went from 7 all the way past midnight. We had everything you could imagine, including foot washing. I didn't like foot washing. Didn't like it. I'd just pick out the ones I'd want to go wash their feet because I didn't want to get near feet. I'm sorry. I've repented over it. So please forgive me about it. I love it. Now I even preach on it. But then we'd do that. And so there was a woman in our church and her name was Mary. And Mary was, came to the service and she was there. And now it was after midnight. The glory of God was still moving. Everybody was still, you know, kind of like just kind of marinating, as it were, in the presence of God. Nobody wanted to leave. And all of a sudden, the, the doors like that sprung open. And this, this, this sorrowful cry went out. Mary! Well, a woman on the front seat named Mary, that was her husband. Mary, and then it dawned on her. She jumped up and said, John, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Come on, come on. And he ran to her in the most pitiful way you could imagine threw her arms around her. Oh, God, he said, I thought the Lord had come and I've missed it. And then the testimony that he gave was this, and she gave. She got up and told the church he didn't want to serve the Lord. And so she would say to her husband, John, now, John, one of these days, you're going out and living your life, and you're doing your thing, and you let me go to church. And you've always said to me, be back by 10. Would you do that? Because he was terrified that the Lord would come. Well, so be home at 10 so I know the Lord hasn't come. And so she forgot to tell him this is a midnight hour, and he was going to go carouse. Well, he got in at 12 o'clock, and she's not there. But what made this ultra dramatic was... She was in a hurry and late for the service, so this is what she said. She said, I quickly ran into the children's room, the two kids, and I undressed them real quick. And I just sort of dropped their clothes down in a little pile, and then the next one, uh, you see where this is going, don't you? I dropped that little pile, and then she was in a hurry. And so she had run in there, kind of got herself and had dropped her dress, whatever, and then put her on. And so there were three little piles. Well, when he came home, he saw those three little piles and he went, oh my God, I missed it. And that's why he ran to the church. And let me assure you that John never missed a church service in his entire life because the day is going to come. And there's a good chance it's going to be when we're in church. Because we love church. But now just think for a moment. Let your imagination run just a little bit with me. Just think for a moment. There's a very good chance in Monroe. It's solid rock. And the one north and south. That the day could come when uh, there's going to be a lot of piles of clothes that are going to be left in the seat and the authorities are going to come in and they're going to try and reason it away and the news has always mocked the church the news mocks the Christian it isn't the word God that the, that the news doesn't like. It's, no, no, it's not the word God. They can attribute that to different things. But what really gets to him is the name Jesus. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. The intolerant audacity of this thing called the Christian church believes that it is an exclusive group of people that's going to make it from earth to heaven. And it's not those that believe in Buddha or Mohammed or anything else, but there's only one name given under heaven whereby men might be saved, and it is the name that is above every name. It is the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it tonight? Shout hallelujah. But now there's a caveat to that. Let me, let me say this. No one knows the hour when he's coming. 
It says, not the angels. Only the Father knows when he'll give the order. Go bring my children home. And the Savior, the Son, will be dispatched from his place. And he's coming back. And 1 Thessalonians 4 said, that the trump will sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And that word in the original simply means snatched away. It's like being grabbed by the nap of the neck. Now you see me. Now you don't. In a moment, that ought to make an Episcopalian want to shout. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trump of God will sound, and he's coming back for his children. The graves will open, and the Bible said we're going to meet him in the air. Think about that. The raptured saints are going to meet him in the air and go back home with him. But now, the news media will handle it a different way. They're going to say things like, well, we tried to tell you there's a mothership coming. It's going to extract all the people and and they're going to reason it away. They're going to reason it away that all of you will be gone and, and your clothing will just be on the, on the ground. I got to thinking about all the people watching all of you sing tonight and watching that Johnny. That Johnny's a force. This whole gang up here is a force. The whole thing up here is a force. You can't help but just stand over there getting ready to preach. And, and there's Selena, Sister Selena right there. And she, she's just a rocking and a rolling and a shouting all over the place. I'm telling you, uh, this, is, this is a little bit of like what heaven's going to be like. Just think about that. It's just going to be a place. And, and those people that say, well, I, I'm just not very, very emotional. Oh, really? We're going to be watching out for you in heaven because you're going to be dancing and jerking and shouting all over heaven because you've got a lot of catching up to do. I'm here to tell you. Somebody said, well, you can't find any place in the Bible where Jesus ever shouted. Yeah, well, maybe not like that, but I can tell you this. I can find you places in the Bible that those that he touched, they went leaping and they went shouting for Jesus. Joy. Are there any leapers left in the house here tonight? Because you remember where you were when the Lord found you. You remember the hell pit that he brought you out of. You remember how he said, oh, hallelujah, how he set you free. Excuse me just a minute. I'm going to dance. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Well, somebody said, I don't like the way you dance, Dwight. I wasn't doing it for you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So in an hour, when you think not, I'm on a mission. I want to see the church waking up to that expectancy that it just permeates in the pew that we keep our eyes upon the eastern sky because as long as we believe we're on the brink of the glorious return of our holy Messiah, the King of Kings, this time when he comes back, he's not coming back to the city of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. This coming, this time he's coming back with his saints. First he came back for the saints. That's for you and me. And all those years later on timing, he'll come back with us. So you better know how to ride a horse. You're in the right place. They can teach you right here. 
That man sitting right over there, he can teach you everything about a horse you need to know. Now, bulls, he needs to stay off of them. But those horses, he, he knows everything about them. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to be right there with him. I want to be right up close. I want to be right up close to the king of kings when we come back. In fact, I'm going to be so close, he's going to say, Dwight, get on your own horse, son. You, they got one over there for you. You have to get on over there on your own horse. Well, that's not in the Bible, but I'm having a good time talking about it. What I'm trying to say is, are you excited about the thought of the glorious rapture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that he's coming back for his saints? But now that little caveat I'm talking about is you must be ready. Because God knows the heart. And now he knows if you're ready. You can't fool God. Then the second thing that I want to say to you, if your eye is on eternity, do you know the date of your death should the Lord tarry? Because everybody in this room is, is going to die. Well, what a morbid thing to say. I'm just telling you what the scripture said. You know it and I know it. Some of us, I probably only got 20, 25 more years. Work with me, people. Don't make me come down there now. Brother Copeland thinks he's going to live to 120. And he probably will, should the Lord tell you. He's just one of those kind of guys that's got that faith for it. But now think about this. No one in this building can tell unless maybe a, someone here that the doctor said what's going on. You have six months or three months. But for the most part, every one of us in this room, we don't know when that hour is. So when you live... In the light of eternity, when eternity lives in your heart, the thought of eternity in your heart, eternity means forever and ever and ever. How in this world can any person under the sound of my voice, how in this world can you risk eternity forever and ever and ever in the presence of God in a place called heaven with the Holy Redeemer and God Almighty and walking up and down the streets of gold or the elite in the Hebrews the 11th chapter here comes Isaiah there's Jeremiah there's John the Baptist all of these people you're going to live with how in this world can you risk for the paltry price of what this world can offer so in an hour when you think not he's coming and then you don't know when you're going to die phone call came it's my father Said your son, brother's been in a wreck. He's 29. We went there. 11 hours and 45 minutes later, he was gone. And I talked to him 11 hours and 45 minutes earlier. He said, I'll see you tomorrow at church. But he was gone. Just like that. Had no idea. The man that heard us preach. He came to the service. And just hours later, his wife drove in. There he was. He'd been in the service, preached on heaven. She found him laying in the garage. He was gone. I was preaching on television, message on the white throne of judgment. His name was Dale. His wife's name was Arlene. And it was a two-part message. And I said, tune in next week and hear the second part of this. And he said to his wife, Arlene, Arlene, 
Let's not forget to be sure and tune in and hear Dwight's conclusion on the message, the white throne of judgment. She walked out of the room and came back in and brought him a uh, lemonade or something. And she said, that's the last thing he said was, let's be sure and be able to listen to the conclusion of the message. But he never heard it. But he drew his last breath. She said, I walked it and he was slumped over. He was gone. We had a we had a man that was on uh, going to be on television, and he had written a book. And the book was about how he had died, and he was pronounced dead, and he saw all these things, and then he came back from the dead. And he was on television that night to tell about his out of the body experience and what he saw when he went to heaven. And we waited for him at the car at the hotel, and he didn't show up. And finally, we had to go on. We thought, well, somebody else, probably a friend, came by. And, going to... and I'm now on the set, and it was time for him to be on. About an hour later, they brought me up a note. He still wasn't there. And they brought me up a note that the security at the hotel went in and broke down, uh, got inside the door. And there he was, fully dressed, just sitting there, Bible in hand, ready to come on down and get into the car and go with us. He was going to tell about an experience. He went to heaven and came back and it's in this book and he was going to talk about that but he didn't get to talk about it to us they found him he had made his way to heaven he had no idea he wasn't going to get to talk about that book because now he was in the presence of God away from the body and present with the Lord Boy, that stabbed the heart of the devil, didn't it? That last enemy the Bible describe, describes called death suddenly became an entry point into the very presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And because he lives, because he came out of the grave, I know I'm coming out of that grave. And not only that, I'm coming out of grave, the Bible says, the same kind of resurrected body that Jesus had when he came on resurrection day is exactly the kind of body that every one of us are going to have when we come out of that grave. I ask you tonight, are you ready if you should draw your last breath? Are you ready? And finally, I just want to kind of conclude this with this. There's something in this room that we've been evident. It's evident from the very beginning when I walked in this building, I could feel it up in that room where I was. And I wanted to get down here quick. I didn't want to wait and come in like it's preaching time. I want to, I want to get in the glory where it's coming down. And I walked in in the glory. What was that? That was the anointing of the Spirit of God. The precious third person of the Holy Ghost. I feel like I've been walking in an anointing for days. I humbly say that. It's, you, just, you just have to know what I mean to appreciate that. And I, I find myself talking more in the heavenly language than I do in preparation for even just waiting for this service. Yesterday when we came and I'd find myself not even realizing it. I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. There's something about the Holy Spirit. And I realize that your, your first encounter with the Spirit of God is that, that encounter that you suddenly realize, I'm, I'm lost. And it's that wooing and you may not remember the sermon that the preacher preached. You may not remember his text. You may not recall the points he made. But all you can remember, the singing was different that night. You, you come to church. And the churches are filled with people. Now listen to me real closely. Filled with people that will never experience what you've experienced already tonight, and that is this wave. It's like a wave after wave and after wave of the 
presence of the Holy Spirit. And that night, something was different. The singing was different. Something inside you was stirred. The devil had you bound, and now something was stirring on the inside. And you couldn't wait. You didn't know what it was about or what it was for, but you just couldn't wait to do something. And then he called you, or she called you. This is the night to make the decision. No man, the scripture says, no woman, no one can come to God unless the Spirit brings him. I punched Brother Phil a while ago and I saw all this group right here. I saw all these young people and these children. I mean, they were in the Spirit. And I said, Brother Phil, just look at that. And we both just looked at one another, just looking at these children. The anointing of the Spirit of God that's upon them. I've said it many times. If I live anywhere, God only knows how far I'd want to be right here in the middle of the spirit that dominates solid rock church because I would want my children and my seven grandchildren and my eight great great grandchildren to be exposed to the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a revival of the power of the Holy Ghost. If you're looking me to start acting like I made it, you can forget that. I feel like I'm just now getting into it. I feel like I'm just now more on fire than I've ever been. Standing up here tonight feels like the first time I've ever stepped behind a pulpit. What is it? It's the fire of the Holy Ghost. No wonder Jeremiah said, it's inside me like a fire. I don't want to cool down. I don't want to cool off, and I don't want you to cool off. And I'll tell you that, Pastor uh, Darlene, you're not going to be able to cool off. And that Pastor Lawrence is going to make sure you're not going to be able to cool off. And Johnny's going to make sure we're going to keep singing in the power of the Holy Ghost. Because let me tell you, what the old dead church needs today is a mighty invasion of the wind of the Holy Ghost to sweep that church. Talk among yourself for about 30 seconds. I'll be right back. Okay, time's up. Let, let me put a caboose on this if I can. I don't know if I can just yet, but it's, just like, it's 8 11. So this is my birthday. So I get to go 10 minutes more. <laughs> is that okay? Will you, will you hang in with me? Just, everybody will give me 10 minutes more. Just raise your hand. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Oh, thank you very much. I'll take it. Listen to me closely. What is it about the Holy Spirit that the Bible says, don't grieve it, don't trifle with it, better understand blasphemy, better understand don't mess with the Holy Ghost. It's the one thing that the scripture will talk about when it comes to the word blaspheme. All other sins can be forgiven, but not the blaspheme of the precious Holy Ghost. And I think about how many times people that the churches are packed with, people that will come and they found them a place to where, as one said, we have a whole group of this kind of people sit together. And it's the only place we can go to where we, we don't feel convicted of our lifestyle. Now just think about this for a minute. I don't need to make that point to make this point better. 
But the truth needs to be heard. It, it must be said. But I don't use the word sin in my preaching. Now just, just listen to me for a minute. But I feel like the scripture said that they will come when, when, when men will seek out preachers and teachers with itching ears that will find somebody that will accommodate them and tolerate them. They found finally somebody that will verify them that how they live doesn't require a change in their life. But Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, never, condemn, never condemning. He loved her. They wanted to stone her when they threw her in the dirt in front of the Messiah. Moses' law said kill her. Jesus walked on the scene. Eh? And he, he stood his ground. And he wrote in the sand the message that said that you that are without sin, you cast the first stone. There wasn't any condemnation there. He, and they laid down their stones and they walked away. And he looked at that woman caught in the act of adultery. My question is, what first thing, what are they doing walking through her bedroom anyway? That's for another day. We'll talk about that one. But he wrote in that and he said, your accusers are gone. But then he gave her this one instruction. You remember? He said, go now. And go on your way and sin no more. And now that I'm hearing too much, it's kind of too much. It's almost like that people understand. Now, once you just believe, you can go ahead and live like the devil. Do what you want to do. Go on and just do what you want to do. I, I, I want to tell you something. I'll never forget this preacher that went into a church. And he had some friends. And when the service was over, he's well known. I don't mind telling you who it was. It was Jesse Duplantis that said that. And he said, I went into this place and some place and when it was over, he said, the pastor and others said, come on, we're going to go out and, and get a beer. And Jesse said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've already been that way. I've already been to those places. I don't have any desire for that stuff anymore. What I got, I don't want to go back there. I want to go with him where he's going. I'm here to tell you something. What's the big deal about telling everybody and keep pressing it and pressing it? Now you can go out and sin. It's all covered. You can do what you want to do. I'm here to tell you, all things are passed away. All things have become new. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I want to please him. I don't want to go back to the hell hole where I came from. I want to be able to walk with him and be what he wants me to be. I don't want sin in my life. I don't want to hang around in those kind of places. I've decided to follow Jesus. I believe that the number one word that Satan uses that has successfully damned more people to the abyss is the word called tomorrow. Don't you listen to that, Thompson. He's a manipulator. He's messing with your mind. And how many people tonight that sit in churches that they felt that tug and they succeeded in getting on out of the building and they came back the next time it wasn't quite as convicting and the next time till pretty soon like that one man that would testify that said 
He told his pastor when you first came here, I would have to hold on to the back of the pew to keep from coming to God. But I would always hear that voice. Tomorrow you can make it right with God. And now then, after all of these years, I still come because I think it's the place to be on Sunday. But I have no desire to give my life to God. What happened? That pastor had to look at him and say that there is a place in the point of no return. And when you keep rejecting the Holy Spirit, isn't it, a, isn't it an interesting fact that not only, not only six chapters had been written in the book of Genesis till the, till the Spirit came into play in the mind of God to warn people early, early in the Holy Scripture, not the New Testament, but early in the Old Testament. In the sixth chapter, verse 3, he would say, my Spirit will not always strive with man you can't mess with the spirit of God Come on, you just can't do that yeah. I've seen many times Pastor Darlene preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost I've seen many times Lawrence preaching under the Holy Ghost I've seen many preaching under the Holy Spirit and every time we're exposed to that dynamic influence of the Holy Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Godhead, the Holy Trinity. And then when this morning at the South Church, I had several people come up before I got out of the building and preaching on this subject. They, they would say, and particularly one man said, I've just had something that I, every once in a while I give in to it. It's a weakness and I know it's not pleasing to God and I've, I've ignored it and pushed it back, but I can't go on anymore. Will you pray for me? And I laid my hands upon him and had him pray this prayer with me. And that prayer was, Holy Ghost, go inside me and that thing that I've held on to, take it out. I want to be free once and for all. There's something in me that wants to cry out. Oh, precious, precious people in this room tonight, let us rededicate ourselves in every way and say, oh, God, even things that I'm blinded to, even things that I've given sanctuary, and I've let that little weakness, that little proclivity, that little thing in my life that I seem to lean to every once in a while that want to do, Holy Ghost, I give you permission. Rip that out of my life clean me up everything in my life that prevents me from being what God wants me to be take it out of my life and so my message tonight is living in the light of eternity and that means starting right here right now including this evangelist Oh, God, as this evangelist, if I have a motivation in me that I've, I'm blinded to, that displeases you, oh, God, help me from this moment on that everything in my life, that, that I'm even blinded to, forgive me, cleanse me, clean me up. Does anybody else share that in your own life? So tonight, I want to close by saying, This is time as a body of Christ that we wake up. I don't know, this is not a judgment statement, I'm just saying from my own. I don't know, Zonel and I were talking about that even before church tonight, and she said, do you realize, can you think of the last person you've ever heard on television that got up and talked about, pointed that a man wants to die and then the judgment? When's the last time you've ever heard anybody preach on hell? When's the last time you've ever heard anybody talk about that everybody's going to stand before God? When is the last time you've ever heard anybody preach on the rapture of the church? I hear a lot of preaching on favor. 
I hear a lot of preachers about how I can get me some more money. I'm hearing about how I'm r- talking about how rich I am. I'm just trying to make a point. But in, in the light of eternity, when the most important thing that we have right now is to stand before God and he's going to ask you one question. What did you do about the lost? What did you do? What did we do? Are we just trying to pack a building to where anybody can come in here living any way they want to live and there's no conviction? I'm not taking this back. I'm not taking it back. Because I'll tell you one thing. I'm looking into this camera. I will stand before God. And he said, if I do not warn people of the pending judgment, this is, this is it. This is black and white to me. If I don't warn people of the impending judgment, you're not ready to meet God. If I don't warn them of these dangers, Jesus not only preached everything they would get, but he warned them of things that if you reject it, you realize the devil never tells you the end from the beginning. He didn't tell you, follow me. Come on in here. Like the Las Vegas lights. Hey, come on in here. Las Vegas was built on a bunch of losers. That's why the signs are so big. Come on in here. And the devil, he says, come on in here. He didn't tell you you're going to be a loser when he gets through with you and he's going to take everything you've got. He didn't tell you that. He didn't tell you you're going to wound up in a burning hell. He doesn't tell you that. But Jesus says, come unto me. I'll take away all of your pain and your, your sin and your broken hearts and all that you've been looking for you've never found. You can find it in me. And then I'll take you to a place that I'm preparing for you, a place called heaven. You'll learn quickly that everything that you ever wanted was right here all the time. And his name is Jesus Christ. It isn't Jesus and Buddha. It isn't Jesus and Mohammed. It isn't Jesus and good works. It isn't Jesus and any other way. Peter preached it. There is only one way given under heaven. One name that will save the souls of men. And his name is Jesus Christ. The son of the living God. He alone. Everybody look straight at this preacher. Nobody moving. Everybody in this room, listen closely. You say, Dwight Thompson, I want everything in my life. I want to be ready. Some that may have held on to stuff. Some that's got that hidden sin. And once in a while you may give in to it. An offense toward your brother or sister. You've never been able to get rid of it because somebody hurt you. And you're justified in the natural for that. That They can be dead for 20 years and something will bring that back up in your mind and that rises up like that was happened to you yesterday it's so real unforgiveness is like a spiritual cancer it'll eat you up forgiving them doesn't make them right the man said I was a prisoner to my hurt and my pain. But now the prisoner is free. And I'm that prisoner that forgave. And I'm free. The one that hasn't forgiven is the one that's in the bondage. 
And it's an interesting thing, Mark 11, 23, 24. Big people can get up and quote it, have the faith of God and write on down. But then few continue on in 25 and 26 that when you stand praying, forgive that your Father, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But verse 26, if you don't forgive others, he said, neither will I forgive you your trespasses. So the point is clear. We're talking about eternity. And if you think for one moment, I'm going to hold on to an offense and jeopardize my entrance into heaven in that place called eternity, not this man. Lord, if I'm holding offense and I'm not even aware of it, take it away. You've got to let it go. Because if you want his forgiveness, you've got to give forgiveness. So every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room and no heads bowed and they're not doing anything, just playing a little music and that's all we want. But I feel from the bottom of my heart, I can say this with accuracy if you could feel it. From my head all the way through my legs right here and even into my shoes, it's like a... In my hands, in my body, I feel the sensation of that tingling. And I, I know what it is. It's that in anticipation that I, in my own heart, am praying, Oh God, anything I'm blinded to, He said, Beware of besetting sins, little, little things that. We've kind of let it slip. Whatever it is, we're going to lay it all on the altar tonight. Every bit of it, aren't we? We're giving it all up. This is one night you're going to walk out of this building and from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus, you'll walk out of this building and knowing if you died tonight, if the Lord should come, you yielded to the voice of the Spirit that, Lord, I want to know everything in my life is right with God. Everyone in this room, this is Dwight Thompson. I've just got something in my life. I've just got something that I know you've touched on, and it's just something in my life that I really want to just present it to God and say, Lord, help me with this. Whatever it may be, no heads bowed, no eyes closed. I've said this a thousand times in the course of my ministry. I love the soul of a homosexual. I love their soul. But if homosexuals can come out of the closet and have parades and boasts of their lifestyle, what in the world has happened in the body of Christ? Isn't it about time born-again Christians get out of the closet and begin to shout it from the housetop? And do you really think that I'm going to insult and major disrespect this place called Calvary? that Jesus hung and bled and died. It is said is the most cruel death known to mankind. It is said that they die a thousand deaths on that cross before they die. And you think that I'm going to insult the holy sacrifice Jesus didn't have to leave. Jesus had his place in heaven. Jesus was a ruler of that heaven with his holy father. He didn't have to, but he said, I'll go. He left his father. He left heaven. He left the prestige. He left his position. He left his presence to came to come to this mess of a place called earth and he came to people 
that he would later say, they hated me and they're going to hate you. And he left it all. And he died on that cross. So you don't have to die in your sin. He took your sins. And he took my sins. You know who killed Jesus? We did. Dwight Thompson did. But he got in the death cart. He took my place. And you think I'm going to say, bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you want to be saved, throw your hand up real quick and take it down. And nobody's going to see it. And nobody's going to ever know. Seriously, do you think I'm going to do that? No, sir. No, ma'am. This man called Jesus suffered, bled, and died for me and for you. And I want the world to know I believe in a hill called Calvary. I believe in the old rugged cross. I believe in the royal blood that, that he shed on Calvary's tree. I believe in a hill called Golgotha. I believe in the old rugged cross. And there's only one place you can leave your sin. And that's at the cross of Jesus Christ. This is a big time, serious altar call. It's not predicated on emotion. It's a choice. And the choice is, I choose to bring everything that's hidden everything like an open book everything i want to stand transparent before the almighty once and for all he died for me and once and for all i surrender all to jesus everyone in this room that has i have something i need to surrender to him without one split hasn't has one split split hesitation don't even bother to raise your hand when I count to three I want you to get on your feet and if you want Dwight Thompson to pray with you that you're going to make that cleansing prayer tonight the total complete surrender to him everything you say well Dwight what would everybody think this is a big thing to people. They, they think I'm one of the most spiritual pe people in the church. Well, what will they think? Well, I'll tell you what spiritual people truly think. They think it's wonderful. And I'll tell you why. Because all of us have sinned. And all of us have come short of the glory of God. And all of us have made terrible mistakes. All of us have done things. But if that camera, if that big screen up there were to say, Dwight Thompson, this is your life. And everything I've ever done, every thought I've ever thought, every act I wish I could do, and it began to just go down chronologically in order of all the sins that I have committed. No, I don't want that. Because I know that that I don't surrender to God remains. That that I refuse to give to God remains. Because he said, if you'll confess your sin, he's faithful, he's just to forgive you. Your sin and all of your unrighteousness. And when you do that, everything hidden will not come to light. There will only be one thing by your name. And even there will be many that that will be done tonight on December 1, 2019. That suddenly... When that book was open, the only thing that is beside your name, and oh, how Dwight Thompson is glad. Dwight Thompson. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And as far as the east is from the west, have our sins been removed from us? 
So every man, woman, boy, and girl that says, I have something, I want to get it under the blood. When I count to three, run, don't walk. No, don't run. I don't want anybody to get hurt. But you say, Thompson, get to it right now. I want to surrender everything to God on three. If you want to join with me right here in front, one, two, three, get up and come right now as fast as you can get here. I have something in my life and I need to make it right. I have something I've been dealing with. I need to make it right. I have something that I need to make it right. Nobody knows about it, but I have something I need to make it right. Get up and come right now. How many sense the Holy Ghost in this room? I want Pastor Darlene, Pastor Lawrence, Brother Phil. I want you to just come and just stand with me right here. I believe that I'm preaching very possibly to the generation that is going to witness the greatest event the world has ever known. And that's the rapture of the church. What is your name, honey? Emily. Emily, let me shake your hand, darling. What is your name? Stephanie. Stephanie Emily, Stephanie. What is yours? Rebecca. Rebecca, Emily, Stephanie. All of you, I could call your name. In a moment when you least expect it, one way or another, whether it be by death, when you draw that last breath on this earth, should the Lord tarry, the Bible says that very moment away from the body, you go immediately into the presence of the Lord. Just think about that. Just think about that for a minute. <sighs> One day you'll read, Dwight Thompson is dead. Don't you believe it? <laughs> Don't you believe a word of that? I will be like the bat of an eye into the presence of the Holy King. <laughs> You're doing that thing again, Dwight. I don't like it. I'm not doing it for you. Hallelujah. Into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then Emily, Stephanie, all of you. And then he could come tonight. He could come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And the Bible said, the dead in Christ... They're going to come first. <sighs> then when we, I, I always thought that was appropriate. The dead in Christ just come out like the batter, the twinkle of an eye first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be. Turn around, I'm going to snatch you right to the rooftop. <clears throat> just snap by the nap of the neck. That's what it says. That's what it means. Snatched away. Caught up to meet the Lord in the air and then it says we're going to meet him in the air and then so shall we ever be with the Lord and you think I'm going to jeopardize that for what the world offers we're not going to do that are we we're going to be ready This is what we do if anybody puts a gun in your ribs. All right, let's all do it together. That means I surrender all. I give up. So I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And the next verse says, whosoever. You said, Dwight, if I could only find my name in the Bible, I just found it for you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's your name. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Out loud, strong, powerful. Pray this prayer in faith believing, out loud, strong. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for dying for my sins, taking my place. 
Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't give up on me. This night, December 1, 2019, I stand before you with uplifted hands asking you to turn the searchlight of God upon me and anything and everything that is in my life that stands between you and me fulfilling my place, my call, what you call me to be. Take it away in Jesus' name. Every weakness, every flaw, every hidden sin, every offense, every act of unforgiveness, take it away. I want my life pure before God. I want to be a dynamic champion for Jesus Christ. I want to be an on fire, Holy Ghost filled champion for you. I renounce all other gods. I reject all other ways. I shout it to the housetop. Jesus Christ is my only Savior and all others I renounce. I receive you now in Jesus' name. I'm clean. I'm cleansed. I'm free. I'm ready. I'm ready for the coming of the Lord. The Bible said when one soul is converted, heaven rejoices. Heaven is having a jubilee right now. Let all the church join in and let the church rejoice with heaven. Well, I'm going to turn it over to your pastors, and I want you to just stand there, and they'll dismiss you and do whatever they want to do, but I want to say this to you. Thank you for letting me spend my birthday, December 1, where I wanted to be in that solid rock. There's no way I can tell you how much I love your pastors and how much I love all of you. Now, if she doesn't have me back within a year, pick it. Get you a sign that says, we want that young Dwight back. We want him back. I'm going to wait till she smiles. I'm just going to keep saying it till she, okay, she's pointing at me. I better behave myself. I sure love all of you, and I want to thank you for this privilege. And I want you to know, be ready. Let's all be ready. And you know, I guess this really was all in the will of God because just two weeks ago, this has been a busy fall time of preaching. But it was just a couple of weeks ago, and I won't go into it, but just simply said, the prophecy that pastor made on, over us sort of confirmed what I've always wanted my entire life, and that is to see more souls saved before I go to heaven. And all of the years I've preached come by. And I've told the Lord, I don't care who's going to do the preaching. Just let me be a part of it. I want to see it. And the prophecy said it was a staggering amount. He said, this isn't somebody prone to do this. So it 